Thank you. Um, there's lots of videos in here, so I don't have to do a lot of talking, so that's great. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to be talking about a data-driven design and data-driven design for an architecture and engineering industry like ourselves is it's really looking at how we're embracing data. We're not afraid of it, we're actually taking it to another level. And that's where we can really see how, um, how industries are changing and adapting very, very quickly to data. Um, so data, I think we can all agree that you know, it's uh, big data and, um, and uh, analytics are transforming the con construction industry. And as Toby said, it's a slow burn. But, um, you know, and while data is great, making sense of it is really the answer here. So you can gather all the data you like, um, but actually trying to visualize it, make sense of it, and actually use it for, your, for our purposes is the real key for us, particularly in the AEC industry. So, for us as a, as a company, we're looking at data on multiple levels. We're looking at it from a campus master planning space. We look at it from, for example, um, in the health sector. We look at, say, where, is, where are all the hospitals currently located in Australia? Where is the closest uh, cancer diagnostic center? How far do people have to travel to get to that cancer di uh, uh, diagnostic center? Understanding the demographic of the population, their travel distances, starts our, our conversations with our clients about Instead of maybe spending $90 million on an expansion, maybe we should be looking at a, um, an acute facility closer to where the needs are. The, the use of data, both on a geographical point, understanding um, how um, people are using the cities, how people are you know, getting the data from Opal, getting the data from um, Nike, understanding um, traffic movement, understanding our demographic is starting to become a real integral part of master planning. Buildings, um, efficiencies, utilisation, proximity. This is what I'm going to be talking about today, about master planning. I can talk about all of these aspects of how we're using data. I can speak for many hours about it, but really I'm just going to focus on a small part of that, and that's about master planning, how we're using data from a master planning point of view. It's the reason that I've become really excited about data-driven design is, as been in the industry for 20 odd years, and we get an RFP, there's a building available, it might be a 1960 building, but it's available, and the RFP is we need to put a chemistry um, client, a, cl a chemistry group, department, into this building. And the building's not appropriate, the criteria of the building is not, is not going to be able for them to scale, but it's available. And a lot of the RFPs that we're getting from <coughs> our, our EST sectors, our education, science, and technology sectors, our big health infrastructure sectors, it's a reactionary process. And what we're trying to do is, you know, is to help our clients get ahead of the curve and sort of understand, before we just put that RFP out, let's really use the data to start informing that master planning process. So that for me has been a really big drive and one that I'm really um, keen to talk about. And then we can start using data from the, um, from the building aspects, so we start then driving into departmental use. How many people are getting access to daylight? How are we utilising meeting rooms? Travel distances. If there's a classroom um, peak at Monday at 10, uh, 10 a.m. and we're getting these, these, getting these huge crush points around lifts and student call facilities, how can we use data? start flattening all these peaks and troughs out. So we're starting to, as a design firm, starting to really embrace the use of data. And then you start drilling down into um, proximity and efficiencies and starting to utilise that third space where those uh, friction points occur, where we can start creating new collaboration. So lots of opportunities for the design industry to start embracing data. But for us, we, um, we're having to respond in, in a way that not just having more architects, more people using um, Revit and the like, we're now changing our, our mantra. We've got predictive analytics team, we've got a data and engineering team, we've got computational designers. We're starting to evolve as a practice to start informing the design process. Data isn't the answer, but it informs the design process. 
And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Just one project, one very simple project. It's a master planning project for um, Macquarie University. And I'm going to show you how we use that data to analyze, visualize, and then uh, how it started to inform the, um, the, the design of the, uh, for their master planning. Analyzing data. So when you work with an existing client, you'll get a whole raft of data. And a lot of the effort for us is actually cleaning that data. That's where our data engineers are coming in now. So getting that data and really um, starting to crunch the data, clean it up, and start to make sense of the data. Just having the data means that you can actually go down a whole series of rabbit holes. So the first question you have to sit down with your client is ask, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Because having the, um, uh, the electricity usage or the water usage on a building is not going to really help inform student population growth or, um, or you know, the, um, which department should go into which, you know, which particular building. So understanding the right question helps you then to define the type of data you need. So as an industry, we're actually starting to, starting to look at, the, to complement the, the design team and um, our engineering team with actually with um, data engineers who can take this data and clean it up and help us to understand it. So we have a huge amount of data available to us. And one of the things which was really interesting, so for Macquarie University, we were just about to complete um, uh, we're at schematic design. It was a 30,000 30, square meter building um, and they didn't know who should go in it. Fundamentally didn't know who should go in it. Normally it's the loudest person in the, in the room, one of the deans banging the tail saying, I need to be in that space. And, but they weren't convinced. And so one of the things, we kind of did ourselves out of the job, <laughs> which was a little good move. But what it allowed us to do was then take a step back and start using the data they had available to figure out, the, um, to figure out the, the answer to their problem. So what we did is we were able to use grant funding and public, um, publication funding. We um, data mined the web, because it's all available on medical public, um, PubMed. We were able to identify all the researchers on campus within the Faculty of Science and Engineering overlay that information and actually understand who's actually collaborating with who. Who's writing 50 papers in the last five years? Who's actually getting the most funding? Which departments are actually getting the most funding? And start looking at these core diagrams. The start understanding actually, it's not, wasn't actually biochemistry who are actually doing a lot of work together. It was actually physics and astronomy. And so that allowed us to actually then reshape our, um, our master plan and, our, and really start re rethinking the, the next three buildings. Not the next building, but the next three and four buildings. When you're working with property managers, they always say, and whenever I walk around campus, it's half empty. The spaces aren't being utilized. You talk to the deans and say, we can never find a space. It's always crammed. So what we did is we were able to um, take the timetabling, overlay the student um, student uh, capacities and attendances and start taking their Excel documentation and start overlaying it with dashboards, identifying it where you get utilization in amongst rooms. So what we found was they were going to build a whole raft of classrooms and what they really lacked was teaching labs. So we were able to demonstrate there was huge gaps through their timetabling program that actually would accommodate 30 person, 60 person classrooms. And then sort of and then that and it's all unemotional. You just put the data out there and you say, guys, there is large gaps occurring here, which we know that you can better utilize your existing campus. Don't go and build another, you know, another 20,000 square meters. Start thinking about how you can use your existing campus and really look at where your stress points are. So that's how we took data and started analyzing it in a di very different way. It's not about you know, student hubs and love hearts and how we're going to create this you know, ephemeral space. So it's all about, let's look at what we can do to help you with your master planning process. But just having that data in a 2D format is one thing. The next, the next thing is then taking it to somewhere where we can visualize it. Now the FEM guys very much like the use of, this is very lightweight, very lightweight models. We're using Rhino here and we're bolting data onto very lightweight models. We're not getting into Revit, we're not drawing petitions and floor slabs, very simple, lightweight models. 
for the FM team, they can quickly see where all the high intensity labs are, where all the low intensity labs. When I'm talking about high intensity labs, I'm talking about chemistry labs, vibration sensitive spaces which require, you know, um, uh, if you're doing um, microscopes, uh, microscopy, or if you're doing um, uh, high end uh, instrument needs, or it might be just high intensity environments. So we're taking those spaces and we're just starting, with, this is just us analyzing the existing site. Very helpful to take all that um, 2D data and start bolting to very light, lightweight models. Now that we have a schedule of accommodation, what they wanted to know was about student population growth in the next 10, 20 years. And again, I'm talking about education here. This, can, this is applicable to commercial, retail, healthcare. It's taking that, um, but it's taking that data and it's saying, okay, well, instead of just reacting and doing a piecemeal approach, let's get, the, let's get all those projections and take the schedule accommodation and fasten up the process of how we take that schedule accommodation, identify it in a, in, a, um, in a 2D graphical sense and start dragging these spaces. We've just got these outline theoretical buildings here. And we started dragging these department needs. So this is a this would be a chemistry department. We started dragging and dropping these spaces. It's very lightweight. It's really fast, and it helps us to come to very uh, to come to rapid decision making. So and when it's over, when it starts overflowing, like you're filling up a vessel, it starts showing red through here. So as we keep you know dragging and dropping, we're talking to the to the university. We're saying, well, okay, let's let's have a look at where chemistry and biology and physics and astronomy and, and, and stats and comms should go. And it starts filling up and it, we're starting to look at, well, is it a 10,000 square meter building or is it a 15,000 square meter building? Well, what we're doing here is understanding the brief and trying to firm up the brief um, before we start going up to market. And then with that, as we're building it, we can actually see where spaces are available. It's live, it's, it's responding, to, it's, um, rapidly responding to it and it's something that we are doing in-house and I'm sure many firms will be starting to starting to do this because this is where as design firms we need to be getting ahead of the curve starting to use the data available to help us and our clients and our contractors and our consultants make better decisions. And then we take it to another level and um, if this is impressive, you should get in touch with Jeremy Graham, who's sitting at the front here. This is all his work. I'm just, <laughs> just the show pony. So here's, um, so here we're taking to another level. This is evolutionary planning. So we have a very manual approach where we sit with the client and we start to move these spaces and we start talking about blacking, blocking and stacking. This is taken to another level where we're using genetic algorithms to start applying, start applying. Um, not just space requirements. What we're doing here is um, we're using genetic algorithms to start applying performance requirements such as this department and this department require high intensity labs. This department required to be associated with this, so maybe maths and stats need to be associated with environmental science. So we're applying um, not just space information, but performance and need information. Jeremy's developed a, um, an algorithm that allows them to, sorry, I'm just, um, what you saw there was, it, you'll see it cycling through. What it was doing is it's actually, um, a, it's actually running 100,000 iterations. It's evolving and learning. It's using AI to actually start looking at how we can take all that space and block and stack in the most efficient manner with the requirements associated with it. So let's we'll say, look at an operating theatre and a recovery, they need to be associated together. It might be chemistry and, um, and, uh, and biology, they need to be associated because they have high intensity requirements. So what we're doing is we're overlaying performance requirements and it ran up to 100,000 iterations in under, a, in under a minute. It would have taken me months just to go through those various iterations. Again, it's embracing data. It's, re it's evolving ourselves as a design industry to start rethinking about um, our planning. And again, it informs the design. It doesn't come up with the outcome. It will come up with maybe five, um, five options, which we can then go to the client and start exploring that further. 
But most importantly, when this is the most <laughs> this is the most important part, is that it's all inclusive. It's not just HDR sitting, you know, going away and, and working this through. We do this with our clients there. So we'll have um, we'll have the client, we'll have the contractor, we'll have the QS, and it's all about the um, opportunity to bolt more and more data onto these models to start that decision making process. It's live, it's lightweight, and so we can sit here and go, all right, well, let's let's look at uh, this particular. Um, uh, Schutzel Yards, and so okay, we want to take a moment where we go. Maybe we want to change the mix from offices to, you know, from office to commercial. Maybe we want to rethink the. Um, the it might be uh, dry labs to wet labs, and as we um, as we're blocking and stacking and involving it, it's continual as we we work with our QSs to then bolt costing information on. This also can then score with um, site planning. You could have a contractor sitting there going, well. If we go with this type of arrangement, the site access is going to be far more um, uh, inefficient, and so it then scores it down. And now the, if we move the site building over here, it scores it higher. All we're doing is just applying metrics to our, to our models and expanding that conversation. It doesn't go to the um, QS for them to come back six weeks later and figure out, actually, you, you know you want an 18 story, it actually can only afford a 15 story building. They are in the room, we're talking that through. So it's a very, very rapid process. So, very quickly, I presented just a small element. And I think what we're, what we're showing here is the opportunities us as an industry to take data to that next level. Um, I just want to show you a very quick, quick movie, which is, shows you, as a company, I've shown you about master planning and the opportunities how we do it as a master plan. But the other opportunities that we're seeing in terms of data gathering, processing, understanding opportunities that can come up. There is a really cool dance track that goes over the top of this. <laughs> so here you're seeing some medical um, senses of project we've got in Kuwait. We're looking at rapid test fitting of patient bedrooms. We're evolving the buildings. It's being scored through here. We're looking at, as you expand the building, how many um, options we can create through one singular model. Again, this all this information is sitting in a database. And then that database is lost. We then move that database into something like Dryfus, and then we start pushing that information into, um, into Reddit. So like distances between workspaces, access to daylight, where are those, you know, where are the high intensity spaces where we can actually create collaboration zones? This is important for, um, uh, for hospital care as you're moving through the space. How many patient beds can I see as I move through, the, um, through a ward? Access to daylight. You know, the, if you're in there for long periods of time, how, you know, access to daylight if you, as a patient is incredibly important. Rapidly testing solar analysis. All of this is just a a smorgasbord of opportunities as an industry that we have. Thank you very much. <laughs>